So this is going to start with something like the basic information, and we're going to get more in depth with, um, I don't know, how you got to this point. Okay. And how, how the plane is compared to some of the other planes. Sure. So we'll try to do as we can now, so we don't have to come back. Okay. Later on. All right, so, um, yeah, so just basic stuff. Who are you, sir? Commander Tony Wilson, call sign Brick. I'm one of the test pilots at VX-23 in Patuxent River, flying the F-35. And how did you get to this point in your career? Uh, so I started off enlisted, uh, joined the Navy in 1991 as a nuke electrician on submarines. I was on the USS Boise did that for a number of years and I got picked up for the enlisted commissioning program. Went to school at Old Dominion University right there in Norfolk. After school, went to flight school where uh, I was fortunate enough to earn a jet slot. Went to VFA 106 to learn to fly F-18s and then joined VFA 87, the Golden Warriors out of Oceana and CAG-8. Uh, while I was with them, had the opportunity to support uh, ground troops in Iraq during OIF to include shock and awe. After that, went to test pilot school, uh, which is the first step to becoming obviously a test pilot in Patuxent River. After that, I joined the F-35 program for the first time. Back then, we didn't have a lot of planes flying, but did a lot of simulator work leading up to some of the work that we're doing uh, today on the boat. When I was done with my first tour at Pax River, went to VFA 102 in Japan, uh, did a department head tour in Super Hornet, and then was fortunate enough to return to VX 23 and uh, the F 35 ITF to fly the F 35. So you went, so you went once and then came back. Came back. Exactly. So I'm testing the F 35. Support from Naval Aviation, kind of like uh, Alan Shepard or Chuck Yeager. Well, <laughs> well, I'm not to that level, but well, I, mean, like, I think a lot of people still mad at you guys because you're one of the kind of the next group. Okay. I don't know, just, just uh, being a test pilot. I've so I feel very fortunate to. Uh, I had a skipper who used to say that the four pillars of naval aviation are timing, timing, luck, and timing. So that's really all that happened with me. I fell into the right place at the right time, uh, or that's the way I feel about it. But I do feel very fortunate to be a part of this program and to lead, lead the way to make this machine that's already pretty good, make it even better for, uh, for the fleet so that when guys are coming aboard, aboard the boat on the dark and stormy nights, it, it's easy. They, they know that they're going to catch a, a wire each and every time because the plane flies that good. So speaking of the plane, what's it like to fly? It's amazing. Uh, the plane, it's, it's night and day when trying to compare it to an F-18. The, um, the capabilities that the plane will bring to the fleet are phenomenal. The the aviator inside the cockpit is going to have a, a wide view of the battle space and be able to make rapid decisions based on the information that he or she is gaining in the cockpit and be able to strike the targets in a, a timely manner, hitting the target each and every time. So it's, it's an amazing machine. As far as flying qualities, it's the, it's the best flying aircraft I've had the opportunity to fly. The engineers, uh, both Nav Air engineers and Lockheed Martin engineers, have done a phenomenal job at making this machine the, the, as easy as they can to, to fly. And that's evident with the way that we're do, you know, with how we're performing out here behind the boat, catching the wire uh, uh, each and every time. And so. So DT2, as, as the name would imply, is a continuation of our developmental test program. Last year we went out on the Nimitz and did DT1, and during that phase of testing we were able to carve out an initial what we call operating envelope. 
you can do all the testing that you want shore based but there's just certain things about the boat that you can't simulate on shore in particular the airflow around the boat the burble you can't simulate that and we have to know uh, with 100 percent confidence how the aircraft is going to perform both in the burble as well as being shot off the the front end of the boat the front end of the carrier so we did a lot of that work during DT-1, and we were able to provide a limited operating envelope for the fleet. DT-2 is just a continuation of that process. What we're doing uh, in particular during DT-2 is we're going to take a look at some, uh, some high wind approaches behind the boat. We're going to uh, load some internal ordnance to move our CG forward to take a look at catapult performance as well as take a look at some afterburner catapult shots and some crosswind performance. Now, after this phase, what's next? So, we'll, we should be out here for about two weeks, and uh, hopefully we'll finish up everything that we came out to do. The next phase is going to be DT-3. That's scheduled to go sometime next year. And really, that's going to be the, the capstone exercise or the capstone test uh, project for the F-35C at the boat. We'll be taking a look at both internal and external stores loading, uh, paying particular attention to as asymmetric loading. So we'll put um, uh, a, a handful of uh, stores, you know, missiles and bombs, weapons under one wing so it's load it all on one side and again we'll take a look at how it performs during catapult launches and take a look at what we call the approach handling qualities with that max asymmetry for approaches behind the boat in all different types of wind conditions. So for the last thing we're talking about is the helmet. I don't know everyone, everyone, wants, to <laughs> everyone, everyone yeah. wants to know about the helmet. So I know you answered a ton of questions about it but for people who haven't heard So the helmet is a, a leap in technology from what tactical aviators have been flying with for the last 20, 30 years. If you take a look at legacy aircraft, F-16, F-14, F-18, they all have a HUD or a heads-up display, a piece of glass that sits in front of the pilot and displays critical flight information, um, airspeed, altitude, attitude, as well as weapon status, uh, targeting information. So the pilot garners a lot of information off this heads-up display. And it's very important, especially for a tactical aviator, because every time, if you take taking a step back, back in Vietnam, it wasn't the, the threat that you saw that got the pilots killed. It was a the threat they didn't see. So aircraft designers have tried very hard to let the pilot keep his head out of the cockpit as much as possible to scan the area around him. So with the HUD, it's a very defined space where the information is provided. With the helmet mounted display or the HMD, the pilot now has the ability to look all around and still have critical flight information, uh, targeting information, um, information about threats. Um, and it's all displayed on the helmet, it's all integrated. So no matter where the pilot is looking, he or she has that piece of information available to them. So I guess the final question is, what's the best part about being um, like flying the F-35? You know, there's so many things uh, about it. The, you know, the excitement of getting to try something new and uh, doing something for the first time. The sense of satisfaction that you are helping develop a, a safe and lethal machine that the fleet is going to be able to use, that we're going to bring stealth to the fleet, and they'll be able to employ that against uh, America's enemies. Uh, the Ike as a host has been fantastic. You know, um, the crew has been been welcoming and excited about having the the aircraft here. There's the uh, there's the the friendly, you know, rivalry obviously about the uh, the plane, but you know the the crew has been fantastic. 
everyone has, is excited about the plane, asking questions, um, which makes makes the team makes our team feel better because to see the fleet getting excited about the plane. And one of the more interesting things I've found about this is we have the brand new pinnacle of naval technology on one of the Navy's the oldest warships, and how all that can coexist together. How do you feel about that relationship? So it, it's, it, is, um, it is a u unique dichotomy to see the newest war or the newest fighter on one of the oldest decks in the, in the fleet. Um, and to see them integrate seamlessly, um, it's, it's a testament to both the ship designers of past and the aircraft designers of, of present that were able to, to take brand new weapon systems and put them on uh, our warships, regardless of how old they are. No, not really. <laughs> okay. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. No, no worries.